The backdrop for this adventure tale is a proper big gravel pit in spring. What do you think it is that's so evocative about a venue like this? For me, it's all about the solitude. You know, all my experience of big pits, especially ones that sort of size, that I've always been on my own or hardly anyone about, you know? And it's the mystery as well, isn't it? You just never know what there could be in there, you know, big sheet of water and that. There's so much I love about them. I love the big open views, you know, on a big pit, it's always a big wide open sky, isn't it? You know, different wildlife, different plants. I just love everything about it. Yeah, I think we can agree that those big pits are special at any time of year, but going into the spring, that's something else, isn't it? It's got to be the carp angler's favourite, isn't it, spring? I love all the seasons, but uh, there's something about spring. I think it's, it's, you've gone through all the winter, you know, and then suddenly you, can, you feel the sun on your face, you know, everything's coming back to life, you know, everything's turning green, all the different plants, insects are buzzing. Yeah, favourite time of the year, without a doubt. Especially somewhere like that, you know, wild, untamed, you know, not many people about. I know this was a new venue for you, Tell, and um, going into a spring campaign, you usually like to start pretty early. Is that the case on a really big pit as well? Yeah, uh, size of the pit, and that wouldn't, wouldn't bother me too much um, if I already had a bit of knowledge about the place, you know. This, it was all brand new to me. Uh, the ticket started in January, not the best time for looking around a 70 acre pit. So yeah, I, I, and, and, and obviously I didn't want to start until sort of April time, but even then I was slow to, to get going. It's not as though I was, there, I was there on my own, you know, I've got access to a boat, I can use a boat, boat around the lake and check stuff out and that, Le learn quickly then. But at the time the water was still coloured, so there was little point in going out in a boat anyway. Um, and as I say, I wasn't on my own, you know, there was half a dozen other more long-term members. Well, a couple of newer members. Um, some of those lads had already been fishing it for years. You know, one lad had been fishing there sort of the last four or five years. Uh, another mate, uh, I'm sure you know, Jim Epper, like, you know, uh, he'd been fishing it all the last year. So, so, you know, basically they already had their areas established, you know, they knew where they were going from, from Christmas time, do you know what I mean? Uh, whereas for me, it was all brand new, it was all different, all new. Um, Water was still coloured, as I say, so didn't have a, it wasn't much point in going out in the boat at that point. Uh, so really, for me, it was all about looking, you know, and I think my first early morning visit was April the 6th, uh, and I pulled up outside the sailing club, because the lake is so mature and so overgrown, you know, big snags, big limbs hanging out all around it and what have you, that, you know, you can't get to all of the lake to look at it. You know, like I say, that top end, I've, I'm yet to even look at. Couldn't get to it from the bank or from the boat. Um, but yeah, my first trip, I, I pulled up outside the sailing club. Lovely view from there, big wide open. Could look out across a big sheet of water. And you've got a lot of boys out there in the middle. It's probably the, the, the biggest open water section of lake, you know? But it still felt really bleak and wintry out there, you know? Um, must have been like a thousand goals. Like, you know, so even looking at the water was hard work. I did see uh, a couple, at first I thought it was carp. I see a couple of turns, like big splotches amongst the birds. Um, and on one of those occasions, I, see, I remember seeing a splosh and then sort of 10 minutes later, another splosh a few yards to the left. And I'm looking through binoculars and I watched a big trail of bubbles, but big bubbles, you know, and they carried on for a long, long way. Got to the point where I was thinking, if that's a carp, that's a blimmin' big carp, you know. Probably 20 minutes later, a otter popped up in my margin, so it was obviously an otter, uh, which, you know, wasn't a good sign. And were you planning to fish or just having a look? Uh, planning on fishing, but still looking at that stage. Uh, it, it gave me a chance to get my boat over there as well. My mate helped me out with his van, like, you know, got the boat in the back of it, so I had that there all ready to go. But yeah, more than anything, I was just looking for a window, you know, because although it's a sizeable pit, you know, 70 acres became pretty small pretty quick, I'll be honest. You know, there wasn't that much to go at. You'd think that, what you want about? There'd be loads to go at, you know? But like I say, one end of the lake was pretty much gone, that was taken. So when did it become clear enough that you could actually go out in the boat and have a proper look? It starts to clear first where the weed's growing up fastest. You know, the weed helps, acts as a bit of a filter, doesn't it? Um, I think it probably would have been about mid-April I had my first boat around. And even then, no, I only really boated into the lagoon area, all around the entrance. That's where I saw all the shallow ground. Um, and in the lagoon itself, lots of silk we've grown in there and that. But it's not like I boated all of the 70 acres or even I boated a fraction of it for that first boat around. So, so far, Tell, you didn't have much to go on. Curry wasn't great, still early in the year, you're not seeing very much. 
other areas of the lake are already sort of dominated by other anglers. You know, how, how do you, where do you start? You've got good old Google Earth. And obviously I've been looking at that through the winter, you know. Um, but the, the existing, the up-to-date Google Earth image wasn't so good. You know, the water had a little bit of colour in it, well, a lot of colour in it, so you couldn't see any of the features. Uh, but what I ended up doing, um, it's funny, I always use my iPad for Google Earth, do you know what I mean? But uh, on your main computer, you can download Google Earth Pro, which is what I've done, uh, and that enabled me to go back on some of the older images. Uh, I think, they, what, what do they call it, the historical images section, do you know what I mean? But I went back uh, and I think I found a shot, I found lots of shots, like, you know, right back. It was interesting looking at it, because you could see when the lake had hardly any foliage around it, you know? Um, but all of the shots still had colour in the water, which was unusual, because uh, the owner had said to me, you know, at times it does go crystal clear through the summer months. Eventually I did find a, a, a fair shot, you know, it wasn't great, um, still had a bit of colour in it, but you know what it's like, if you, if you up the brightness full, and it burns your old retinas, doesn't it, like, you know, especially if you and, and then go in a dark room and you can just about make out the paler features, uh, and what I was looking for was the paler features, the shallower ground, um, and there was a lot of shallows it seemed out in the central area of the lake, where all the boys was, so you couldn't sort of go through the boys to get to it but uh, it seemed to come off away from those boys and then go right into that corner where the first bay and the first little point was. It, it just looked the one, mate, you know, that, that particular corner of the lake. Um, it, it needed a, a sort of south southeasterly to blow into there. Um, but yeah, just looking at those old Google Earth images, all the old aerial shots, you know, and, and they were taken at different times. So you could see that at certain times of the year, summer months and that, there was a lot of weed rafts in that area as well. They'd all sort of gank, collect into that bay. It just screamed carp. There was another area that looked really, really good. There's like a lagoon, uh, a little backwater, and it's joined to the main lake by a little bay and a couple of little channels. And the entrance to that, like in the main lake side, was quite shallow water around, around the entrance to it. Looked really, it screamed carp. The lagoon itself looked good, you know, it, was, um, it had weed well before the big pit, the actual open water did, you know, the weed grew up in there a lot earlier. It screamed carp, you know, that, that lagoon area. And there was a little island at the entrance to it that in the past you've been able to fish off, you know, and, and that, that looked a good area, but unfortunately that would have been made out of bounds this year. Um, so again, that was another bit gone. Uh, what else was there? Further down that bank, uh, this is where the southwesterlies blew, and there was a lovely point there of a double swim on it, but quite deep out in front of it, you know, it felt more of an autumn area to me, you know, and I was looking really, I wanted shallow ground, you know, especially for May, June. Uh, not only that, that point is sort of, uh, the main man swim, like, you know, the, the syndicate leader, like, it's where he fishes. So you can see, pretty quickly, there wasn't a great deal to go at. Opposite that, you've got the sailing club bank, um, and there's not really any swims on that bank. There was one possible swim to one side of it, but only about 100 yards out the bank was where one of the other lads, Tony, um, he was fishing, like, you know, uh, and I didn't want to encroach on him. And so, it, basically, it pretty much left one bank you know, that was all to go for. And there was three swims on that bank, uh, three little points. The first one was really nice and you had a little bay to the right of it. Uh, and something I really like, there's a pipe that come in in one corner. I think the water comes from the other side of the motorway. Uh, so that was uh, obviously a, an area I liked a lot. Uh, then there was another point a little bit further up, probably 100 yards away, and then another point, another 100 yards. Sounds like a big gap between each swim, but on big pits where you allowed to use a boat, you know, they, each swim covers a lot of water, like, you know. The water was still a bit coloured at that time, um, but it was starting to clear, you know, like each visit, you know, because I, I did, I had sort of, what did I have? I had three early morning visits and two or three afternoon visits as well. And when you turn up in the afternoon and I'd walk into the same swim I'd been the week before, you know. So I, I'd, I'd done a lot of my watching. I watched from the sailing club and also watched from that third point down. Um, but, and there was a dead pike in the margin, I remember in that third swim down, you know, been there all winter laying there, perfectly in the cold water, it hadn't deteriorated at all, like, you know. But I remember I'd, but each trip, I'd look down at it and the water would get clearer and clearer, I could see more of the pike, like, you know. You know what it's like, mate, that time of the year, big pit, all brand new, it was all really exciting, you know, and, and uh, although I didn't know how many carp were in there, the good thing was I knew they wasn't particularly pressured. You know, and they, they do what carp do in a natural lake. You know, they should follow the winds, they should act like normal carp. And so really I was just, just looking for that first window and keeping a very close eye on the weather conditions. It's not like I was expecting to see carp on that first visit, on that first boat about. Um, but you do see little, you know, you see little signs, don't you? You know, as soon as that water starts to clear enough, I can see little areas that look dusted off at that entrance. 
it's all shallow across the entrance is probably I don't know the entrance itself into that lagoon area is probably about three rod lengths wide but only three foot deep uh, and there was there was definitely signs that stuff had gone on there um, probably no coincidence as well I bumped into my old mate Stuart who I'd last fished with at Burfield many years before uh, and that's where he was in just at that entrance just boating out like you know but all quiet on his little boat with his little dog uh, so yeah I wasn't the only one that, that, that knew that that was a likely starting point. So at this point Tell, you still don't really know how many are in there? No and I had shots of uh, let me think. Um, Tom Stokes had fished it in the past. I had a shot uh, of Tom with a 40 pound common and a couple of other fish. Uh, Jim had had a lovely mirror the previous year, real nice long dark scaly one uh, around the 40 pound mark. I knew that was there. Um, but really I had shots of half a dozen different fish, you know, and I don't know. It's always an awkward one when you're trying to sort of guess how many carp are in a lake, you know. I, I could still have it wrong now, but I'll be honest, I went there expecting a far lower stock than what others had suggested you know and that was just based on previous captures you know um, what I'd seen or, or rather what I hadn't seen you know and those dawn looks and that just it just said to me that it was going to be a low stock and uh, judging on everything that's gone on over the year I think I was pretty much right I reckon there's probably no more than 30 in there I hope I'm wrong do you know what I mean I hope there's 50 or 60 in there but I don't think so I think sort of 25 to 30 fish so when did you finally wet a line and how confident were you feeling? First trip was uh, the last week of, of April. Um, and we had changed, I was going for two nights, but the conditions were changing through that trip. Started off as a westerly. Uh, so I went down, I went down on that bank where the westerlies blew and there was a, a bit of a point. There's lots of points around this lake. Like another point, uh, I think they called it dead oak point. Like, you know, big dead oak tree behind you. Um, and the entry, then, then there's another little island and then just round the corner from that is that entrance to that lagoon that I earlier mentioned and the shallow stretched out quite away from that. The thing is this little island this side of it had a, had a I don't know what you call it, a, a bit of bushes that sort of hung quite a way over you know and I had it in my mind I thought if I can still just about get to that shallow bit maybe I might even be able to go a little bit left of it like you know because you couldn't fish off of that island this spring for whatever reason but I thought if I can get to that and it was even on my mind maybe I could put a pole there like you know against that that shrubbery that's hanging over and get around the corner a little bit further um, it all looked lovely you know on a westerly and all that but uh, and the sun was out as well you know we got the first proper proper spring days that trip uh, but I'd done a night there, I cleared a big patch of, of stinging nettles, you know. Um, it was an old swim, like there's a lot of old swims around the lake, but then they overgrow pretty quickly on a pit like that. So I just opened it out, uh, found a couple of bits that were clean enough, done a night in there. But you know when you just get a feeling it was too deep, just didn't feel, feel the right area. There was a bit of shallows, like I said, out to the left, but largely the swim was deep water. It, I don't know, it had more of an autumn feel to it. In a strange way, it had a bit of a rocky barge feel to it. Do you know what I mean? Like rocky barge and raised me, that's how it felt to me. And um, so yeah, after one night, first thing in the morning, it was just lifeless, you know, not so much as a bleak dead. And I just thought, this isn't where I want to be doing the spring, like, you know. Um, yeah, as I, was, as I was sat there that morning, it was late morning uh, when the breeze finally picked up. It had been bright from first thing, but late morning the breeze picked up and just as it had been forecast, it blew a south easterly, which blew down into that other little bay that I was talking about earlier with that first little point. Uh, and yeah, I, I went for a walk. I reeled in the rods. Uh, took the camera with me from the long lens as well. There's so much nature around there, you know, I loved all of that. I spent a lot of time photographing stuff. But yeah, I went for a walk with my camera. Got all the way round to that swim, that last swim. It's, it's basically the first swim, the first swim when you come through the gate, but it's a long old walk from where I was, I was set up. Oh, I packed up first, I better say that and all, because I'd already made my mind up. There was no way I was staying another night in that spot. So I packed everything up, got it all in the car, so I was ready for a move if need be. Uh, went for a walk right the way round, got to that first point, and you know, um, I was looking at there's a little bucket in the swim, so I sat on a, on a bucket upside down. And you know when you get, it's only a gentle south easterly, but it, you get a little bit of ruffled surface, then it'll go calm, then a little bit of ruffled surface, you know what I mean? But it was blowing directly into that corner, perfect. And I was only sat there about five minutes, and, 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 and it calmed off a little bit, and I saw two bow waves just coming in. From the, they're coming in from range, from the open water where all the boys are. In hindsight, I think that's where the fish held up a lot of the time out amongst those boys. But I see them bow waving in. Could barely believe, they the, remember this is the first carp that I've seen. Then it went, then they were covered again. 
with a ripple, you know, so I had to wait another 10 minutes or so, it went calm again, another bow wave, then I see something chugging up, one chugging up the margin, close. Mate, I was, I, I, I couldn't get back to my car quick enough, you know. It's not as though anyone else was going to go in there, you know, I shouldn't have been in any rush, but, uh, yeah, you know what it's like, I sort of, I, I didn't walk back, I ran back with a big long lens and a camera swinging, swinging around my neck, do you know what I mean? Uh, got round there, pulled up behind the swim, and it's like, oh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm in the right area now. So yeah, got round there, it's lovely, you've got a track that runs round, oh, a good half the lake anyway, you know, so I could drive all the way back to the swim. Um, lovely grass area, I could pull the car up, it was perfect. Uh, got into the swim, uh, got my kit in there and that, but I, I wasn't in any rush, like, you know, really took my time that day. Uh, got both rods ready, uh, classic for that time of the year, chod rigs, you know, I had no idea what the bottom was going to be like out there. I knew it was, there was lots of raised areas from those Google Earth images, but at that point didn't know how clean it was going to be. So yeah, I took loads of time, uh, you know, it's like you, you check and you double check, check and you triple check your rods that day, you know, like make sure, tied the pop-ups on, uh, and it wasn't until sort of late afternoon because really I was just watching, every time it went calm you'd see the car and you'd see what routes they were taking, you know. So eventually I plucked up the courage like to cast to make my first cast. Um, quite a, a fair range, sort of 70, 80 yards out like, you know, and I'm in the water to cast as well with my waders. It's gone out, lead's hit the surface and as the lead's hit the surface, probably a rod length or two to the right of the spot, there's a big eruption. You know, they were high in the water. Like, I still felt the lead down, it was quite shallow out there, seven foot or something like, you know, but a good drop. Um, so not ideal having spooked stuff, but I knew I was in the right area and I'd got a drop with a shoddy, you know, that's good enough. Uh, I squeezed the, rod, the other rod, the left rod, just probably two or three rod lengths to the left of it and again got a decent drop, maybe another foot deeper. Seemed to get, there was like a bit of a knuckle that come out. Uh, the bank went round, there was a bait on the right and it went round and a bit of a pointed knuckle with all trees overhanging. Uh, and that was obviously shallower that went out from that and then got gradually deeper. So if you imagine I've gone a few yards left of it, one rod's a little bit shallower than the other rod, like, you know. Quiet then for the afternoon, well, did see, still see the odd sign. Uh, got my head down, uh, the wind, it went calm in the evening. Um, but when I woke up in the morning, it was overcast and misty. Uh, and you know what it's like on those big pits? Anywhere else it would have been flat calm. You don't normally get a mist with, unless it's calm, do you? Do you know what I mean? But on a big pit like that, there was still a, quite a wind blowing in and the mist was rolling in. Oh, it was just beautiful, mate. It was one of those carpy mornings, you know, where, and I've got two baits positioned bang on. Uh, when I'd got up in the morning, both lines were hanging limp exactly how I'd left them in the evening. So yeah, it, it all looked good. It all looked good. Uh, and from first light, oh, that's the other thing as well, where you got a gray sky and it was all misty and that, and a bit of a ripple on the surface, the water looked silver. Perfect for seeing blackheads. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, it was probably about an hour after the first light I saw the first one. Uh, just stuck his head out and he was only a few yards to, my, to the right of my right rod. Same sort of range though. Uh, but over the next sort of, well, by eight o'clock I'd seen six shows. Probably all the same fish, maybe two different fish. Uh, but by now, you know, up until then I was sort of sat on my hands and like, you know. Do, but by then I'm thinking I need to recast. You know, they're localised, you know. If they'd been scattered on the same line I'd been quite happy to leave them. But they all seem quite localised, obviously a spot. So I've made up, I tied up two fresh pop-ups, uh, reeled in quickly, changed, changed both the pop-ups and then cast them back out but a little bit further right, same range, and got slightly shallower drops, still clean, lovely. Oh, and when I'd reeled in there was just a little bit of, uh, you know, like ribbon weed, you know, which again is perfect for fishing the choddy over. You get drops through it, don't you? They were like proper hard clonks. So anyway, rods are both back out perfectly from half past eight. I suppose it was probably 40 minutes later, it bleeped once, uh, I've looked to the rods, and instead of both lines hanging slack, the right hand one's dead tight. And I've got behind the rod like you do, and it's, it's the line sort of moving, it's still in the clip at that point, and it's just moving, like nodding around, then it's out of the clip. I picked up the rod, and it was one of them, just a dead heavy weight. It's at range, like I say, but just a dead heavy weight. Gone away from me, but it's going left at the same time, and then, and it just kept going and going, but all the while going left. Now, I'd never even, it hadn't even crossed my mind that the boys would be an issue, that's sort of 150 yards away. But you know when it gets to the point where it's had that much line off of you and I was starting to worry, like you know, and, and at the same time I'm trying to get into my chest waders because the fish is going that far left and there's trees in the water to my left and a bit of a branch that went out. 
Um, anyway, I've got the waders on, got in the water, I dragged the net with me, got round the side of these branches, and the water was still quite high at that time of the year as well. It did drop as the year went on, but it was still high then. And I've got round this snag as far as I can, and I'm, I'm almost up to the top of the chest waders, and this fish is still going. And the boys are mega off in the distance. Uh, eventually I've managed to stop it short of the boys, but it's still kiting left. And now I'm just hauling like a madman, because I, out of the, the next swim down is on a point uh, it's a good hundred yards from me, but there's like a an old tree had gone in, a uh, big big dead tree, and it was stretching out quite a way into the lake. And again, like if I, when I started in that swim, if I'd looked at those boys and looked at that snag miles away out there, the last, and I'm fishing all the way over there, you'd never ever think look at them as a worry, like you know. But suddenly it was a real concern. Uh, so I'm hauling, like you know what I mean, and it's under real pressure and all, like you know, trying to get gained line, and the fish is still well off this tree, but it's going left all the while, and it, it, it got got close to it, and I'm thinking at any second I'm going to start feeling grating, and 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 gradually the line just went left, 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 and missed the snag, and I knew I was safe, but I probably only had sort of five or six seconds of relief before then I've read the fish is still going left and I've got a bait on my left that's all full of snags and I've realised the fish is still going right into the belly of the bay. Uh, mate, it was epic, the whole thing. Imagine when you're up to here in chest waders as well and you've got a big sheet of water in front of you. When you're low down, it looks even bigger, doesn't it? And the wind's lapping in, do you know what I mean? And, and, and I've got the rod and I've got the rod all the way down, sunk, I'm up to here in water. Uh, in fact, each time I'm turning, the water's spraying me off the reel. Do you know what I mean? That's out on the reels on the surface. Um, and now I'm thinking, I don't believe it, I'm not going to, I'm now going to lose it in one of these snags, like, you know, and the pressure I'm under all of this time, I can't, you know, way more than I'd normally put on a fish, you know, the, the whole rod's under the water, but you can see the bend in the butt, do you know what I mean? And uh, gained line, gained line, gained line, and again, I'm thinking it's going to start grating at any second, like, kept coming, kept coming, you know, it gets to the point where you can just feel that angle of line change, like, you know, and the, the old thumps get more, more definite, more, to, you know, low, it was close. I knew it was closer to me. And eventually, I did, but I didn't want to lift the tip until I knew for certain, you know, I didn't want to. So I've lifted, lifted the rod and it's only sort of a few feet out in front of me, right, you know. Um, and I say the wind's lapped, it was epic, mate. The whole, the whole thing was epic. And my heart was going like a good one. And uh, the old leg cores come out of the water and amongst the chop, like, you know, a few inches, come on, come on, a couple more inches, couple more inches. And it's this big brown head rolled over in the chop. Uh, and I see big scales on it as well. So not only was it a big one, I could see it was a, a good looker as well. Um, oh mate, I don't know, another minute or so plodding around under the tip, like, you know, and then eventually I've managed to j jostle him into the net. Uh, by now, water's going over the waders as well, like, you know, but I sort of got back round the trees, dragged the net back into the bank, like, you know, and all I want to do is have a good look at it. What have I got? What have I got? First carp out of a new lake. Uh, but yeah, like I say, not only was it a big one, I could see it was a big fish straight away, but it was a mega looker as well. Like not, it, it's everything, isn't it? You know, it's, it's the colours, uh, big scales on it, you know, a uh, um, little bit of an old dent in its back, you know, almost as if maybe it had been hit by one of the speedboats in years gone by and then healed up. Uh, but yeah, proper, proper carp, mate, and the right result for me first bite. I mean, you know, I always act, try, try to act pretty laid back, like, you know what I mean, when I've got a good one. But I have to admit, with that one, like, you know, I, I slipped him into a sack and what have you, and then once I said it, it was, it was one of them proper, you know, yes moments. Yes! <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It was one of them. Like, you know, so, uh, yeah, once it was safely sacked up, uh, I made a quick call, call to Jack, like, you know, and he was soon on his way with the camera. Um, and it's funny, actually, because, uh, uh, Jack had only just texted that he was at the gate an hour later uh, and, and uh, literally I'm just about to reel the old rods in and the left one's gone with a tench, like, you know, which was the only tench I caught out of there, like, you know, but yeah, lovely, sort of, you know what they're like, even big peak tench are beautiful, aren't they, you know, like real dark colours and what have you, about eight pounds, good. At... So yeah, uh, Jack's arrived, got him out, um, yeah, a bit like the old corral swim, like, you know, I tied him up to this dead limb poking out. About 20 knots, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got him out. Uh, and and my, my, my best memory of it, you know, often I think it's a shame to even lift them up. You know, when you first unwrap them from the sack, like, you know, and it's at your knees and it's got a bit of an angle, it's sort of laying against your knees and it just looked mega, you know, and I paused, you know, I could knew, I knew that Jack was looking at what I was looking at and I thought that is as good as it gets, you know, real mega, mega carp. Uh, 
yeah, sky, beautiful, you, you know, hard to choose good, the best side. Do you know what I mean? Both sides of it were beautiful. Um, yeah, put him on the scales, uh, every ounce as big as I thought he was going to be, 42 pound, four ounces. Yeah, done some lovely shots at the back of the swim. Uh, just couldn't have hoped for a better start, mate. You know, and a carp I've never seen a picture of before. Like I say, I'd seen shots of half a dozen fish out there, but I didn't know about this one. Well, you couldn't have wished for a better start, could you, mate? I mean, on a chod rig as well, classic sort of early spring tactics for you on a big pit. Yeah. Was it yeah. a single or over bait? That, that was on a single. Uh, how often fish chod is like, you know, especially that time of year. But yeah, I mean, they're classic, aren't they? April, May time, like, you know, when them first shoots of little green shoots are coming up, you know? Yeah, yeah. deadly in the right hands. <laughs> <laughs> So what is your next move, Tell? Try and establish a spot or pick off fish on singles? Yeah, I mean, for now, uh, having just caught one, uh, you know, you don't want to change a thing, do you? You just keep everything exactly the same. I hadn't even catapulted out a single boil free offering yet. So, so yeah, I mean, I got the rod back out that day, like you do just for a few hours. I was actually off that evening. I didn't, didn't, uh, didn't do an extra night after that, but I was back. I kept a close eye on the weather and there was probably a three or four day back gap and then I was back again, the weather came right again or, or what I thought was right, we'll get onto that in a little minute. But yeah, it came back around southwest, southeasterly, uh, fairly mild and what have you. I dropped in there for two more nights, fished the same, d d fished exactly the same, two singles out at range uh, on choddies, but nothing, uh, really quiet. Although I did have one or two liners. But yeah, anyway, I blank, blanked that trip uh, and really I was just, I had it in my head, because I'd caught that fish, that first fish on the southeasterly, I had it in my head that those were the conditions I was looking for. Not just the southeasterly, but preferably with a bit of sun as well, because it had been cloudy when I'd had the second trip when I blanked. But you know what, uh, we had, if you remember, uh, I'm trying to think, it was through, through most of May, or certainly the second half of May, uh, and into June, we had regular northeasterlies. It went on for like weeks and weeks, didn't it? Uh, and in a chilly winds as well, you know? And I was thinking they were the wrong winds for, for my swim. Um, but as it turned out, you know, anything with an east, that the, the point, it was a little point and the bay was almost set back a little bit and the northeasterly sort of went that way. But on a big open pit, you know, you still got a bit of a ripple blow in, but without the, the brunt of the wind, without the chill. Do you know what I mean? And it was still a good bit. And, and also, in I mean, all of this is in hindsight, you know, you realise afterwards. But where it was flatter, in front of me, you know, the, the light can penetrate either as well. Plus it was shallower ground, like, you know, but the weed grew faster and weed is just a magnet to carp, isn't it, at that time of the year. So yeah, uh, what started off looking like, you know, I could go months and months without the right conditions coming in, it, it pretty much changed pretty quickly. And, um, and I realized the fish were, were visiting that area a lot more than I thought. I actually fished my next, ooh, my next three trips. Uh, I'd done two two-nighters and an overnighter in the next swim up on that point. There was a, a big area of shallows in front of that as well, and then the boys started only a little way out. Uh, and I had good drops there, it felt good. You know, the weed was coming up, but like, it was still well presentable with choddies. Um, and you've got a big snag tree that comes out to the left as well. I really liked it there. The, like the trunk was all ivy covered, but I used my old sacketeers and pruned out a little bit, and that was a perfect seat, and you had a lovely view of the lake, left and right, like, you know? I probably would have carried on in that area. Uh, you know, it just felt right, and the spots I was, it, each time I left, I'd put out a pound or two, you know, not loads of bait uh, on a pit like that. You, you're not sure if it's getting eaten or not, you know? But the spots were definitely getting cleaner. Each time I went back into the swim and cast out, I was getting better drops. Uh, I think it was, yeah, my third trip in there, I, done, I had two nights, and I'd done my first night in there, and then in the morning, the, the wind was a northeasterly then, and then in the morning, um, it was bright and sunny, and I could see that there was a bit more east in it, and the wind was rippling down into that first swim, my original swim, where I'd caught the 42 pounder from. Uh, so I took the boat out, uh, drifted down there in the boat, and didn't go right into the bottom of the bay at first, I went across to the far side, and then you could sort of, you had a good angle, you could see down into the bay, and there was like, sort of rafts of weed had already started to build up there against the tree line and just from a distance I could see two small carp sat there. I'm in a boat and I'm, I'm, I'm probably 20 yards away from them like you know but I could see there was two fish there. Uh, so I've sort of gone round and took a wide arc, got over onto that margin and then crept tight all the way out the margin like you do. This sort of bush is hanging out you know you'd have to go round a bush and then in a little bit but eventually I've got to a bit where I'm only probably 
three or four rod lengths away from these two fish, and I'm up against the bank, but with a bush in the as cover, like you know. And then the wind and the wind's rippling in at me, uh, bright, sunny, looked perfect. So I thought, well, I'll just stay here for a little bit. You know, it was mid-morning. You know, there's already two turned up here. There's likely that there's going to be more turn up. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. In fact, the first fish that I saw swim in was a big, long, fully scaled that I recognised because my old mate Jerry Ammond had caught it only a week or two previous at 35 pound. Mega carp, black as your hat, long, absolute belter, like you know. Um, yeah, no, I saw it, but it saw me as well, even with the cover, you know, against the trees and what have you. It definitely, you know, you know when they've seen you, a bit of a flinch, like, you know, and then it went round in an arc, and it's, you know, and then it decided, yeah, there's definitely a geezer stood there, and so off it's gone. Um, probably 20 minutes or so later, two more came in, two 30 pounders, a mirror and a common. Uh, one or two little lifted scales in them as well, you know, they probably just, just started to go through spawning at that point. Oh, I've missed that actually, because on that second point up, uh, those first two trips in there, I had seen fish spawning. I see probably probably a dozen or so fish. It wasn't good light to see them. Uh, the sun sort of comes up at, in front of you, you know. She, and, and I was high up on that log that I mentioned earlier, the fallen tree. You know, encouraging to see carp spawning, like you know. So anyway, back to this uh, original swim down in the corner. I'm on the boat. I've seen that fully scale come in, and I've seen two different thirty pounders. Like they didn't see me, like you know. And then they've gone off, and I've crept out, gone back into actually. Uh, I used the boat to move. Yes, yeah, so I boated, went straight past that first swim, went up to the second point, loaded all my kit into the boat, and then and then boated down. So I'm now back in the original swim. My fishing in that original, that first point up until then had all been at range. You know, just two choddies at range. Um, but the weed's starting to come up a bit now. I'd looked at that area from the boat, and I could see it was getting a bit too too weedy. There was some little spots, but you know, bar dropping a rig from a boat, you were never going to hit them from the bank. Uh, and besides, I'd seen those fish a lot closer in, just in the bait and right. I wanted something on that line, closer. Um, and I'd had the odd liner that I mentioned. That was what I was looking for, something close. And I found, I found what I wanted in the middle of the bay to the right, right in the centre of the bay. There was like a hump, a raised area. That was my right-hand rod sorted. And, and to be honest, I felt that that was the bank. That was going to be the spot. It just looked perfect. Um, but you know what it's like as a token gesture, like, you know, you want to spot another spot, don't you? And I found a bit out to the left, only sort of, 15 yards out or something, you know, a um, bit of a bar, weed over a lot of it and silkweed on a lot of it as well, but little patches in amongst it, you know. Bit hit and miss, you know, because I was still casting from the bank at this point. That's something I should probably go into a bit more detail on as well, because, you know, you could use a boat to drop rigs, but the problem is there's speed boats on there through the daytimes, and you never know when they're going to go in, you know. Sometimes they're out all the way up until dark, and it's no good going out and hoping to find a spot when the, the light's going in the evening, you know, all rushed and what have you. Uh, so ideally, if I could, I wanted to be fishing from the bank, I wanted to be casting. Um, and both of those spots that I've just mentioned, I had a spot in the middle of the bay to the right, a spot out to the left, I had a bit of silkweed over it, but they were both close and I could, boat, I could cast them easy enough. So yeah, pretty much because of the boat issue, you know, the speed boats were out in the daytime. Not every day, you know, sometimes they wouldn't come out. And that was nice then mornings, you could leave the rods out longer, because when they did turn up, it tended to be eight o'clock in the morning, like, you know. So yeah, what I used to do, I used to go out in the boat, find the spots, I knew where both spots was, I could the boat straight to them, uh, and then I had my old film canister markers, uh, and I'd just I'd get, I'd get to the, find the best bit of the spot. The one to the left turned out my favourite, but like I say, to begin with, it was a little bit here and there. But I'd drop a marker, put some baiting around it, go back to the bank, then cast out, clip up to it, get it all clipped up nice, then go out and retrieve the markers, because you couldn't leave the markers out there. The boats would go through them and take them away anyway, you know? I don't think they'd be too happy about that. And that was the first time I fished bottom baits as well. You know, I've got good, good enough ground to fish clean on the, on the bottom, uh, two 12 millers, just hard on the bottom with a flipper rig. So yeah, mate, I'd get them clipped up, all ready for the, for the night ahead, you know? And, um, you know, I mean, you could have used, nowadays, you know, everyone to use wrap sticks, like, you know, that's what I'd advise to do. It's the easiest way, but uh, I had a nice straight track behind me. Um, so I'd just walk, I'd, I'd, I'd little piles of rocks on the track, like, you know, so both spots I'd marked up and it was the same as using the wrap stick, really, you know. Uh, and sometimes I'd put a little bit of the old marker gum on there as well, you know, just in case. But, um, so yeah, that evening I've got both rods out nice. Uh, first half of the night, oh, and I should mention as well much, but I didn't use a great deal of bait. Um, you know, it wasn't loads of carp visiting that area, you know, so I never went, wanted to go too mad. So I put out sort of 50 or so 12 millers and a little sprinkling of pellet on each mark. So rods out that evening, uh, first half of the night, by two or three liners, like you know, so it was looking good, all on that left rod, which wasn't the rod I was expecting. I was much more confident on the right, it was a cleaner area. Uh, 
anyway, early hours in the morning, that left rod has whizzed off. Uh, so I mean, it's my second fish, uh, typical big pit battle, you know, when they go off away from you, have 30 or 40 yards of line off you, you know, and then come to a halt and then you just sort of reel them in on the surface, which was handy because the weed by then was really growing up thick as well. Uh, you couldn't see it from the bank, it just looked like you had clear water, but when you went out in the boat, you could see you only had a foot or two of water over the top of it. Um, got it in, laid it on the mat, and I have to admit to thinking it was a much, it looked a giant, like, you know, a uh, big long common. Um, and uh, for a short while, I was thinking it might even be the one that Tom Stokes had caught two or three year, years earlier at 40 pound an ounce. Uh, but I put it on the scale, it was 32 pound. I weighed it two or three times, like, you know, 32 pound. Um, but a lovely old carp, uh, and when I talked to the, the syndicate leader, like, you know, he said it was one of the older ones, like, you know, it doesn't get caught a great deal. Uh, did have a couple of little water nibbles on it, like the base of its tail, a little bit, you know, you can just tell, you know, not mauled, but definitely a couple of little marks here and there of it, where I felt that an otter had probably played with them a little bit in the, in the winter months. So now your baiting spots tell, I guess the chods are out of the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like uh, that, that, they've got time and a place, haven't they? You know, I love them, especially early spring. But um, yeah, no, no. Now, now I'd found clean, gravelly areas. You know, I wanted to fish in, fishing hard on the deck, bottom baits, and and I was confident as well. I had a, had a new bait to try, lovely little twelve millers. You know, so yeah, I really, really wanted to be fishing on the boy, on the bottom and with boilies and, and sprinkling a bit out there. So, are you still seeing fish in the area, Tal? I mean. Not so much that that was when I caught that common, that was only my third trip in, in that swim, you know, and you'd seen signs and all that. Uh, I'd seen a couple from the boat, I'd seen that, that very first trip, I'd seen a little bit of a display. Um, but yeah, it's not like I was seeing a big display each dawn or anything like that. The fourth trip, I probably saw more signs than I had in all those trips prior to it, you know, uh, especially the first evening. Um, I had liners. Uh, which was really, I was only fishing 10 to 15 yards out and I was getting liners which told me they were coming through short and then just on dark it was confirmed like two or three actually locked out, like a broad length and a half, two rod lengths out, really close in. The bay to the right has got some big big trees and overhanging foliage like you know, a few snags and what have you and I felt that they were probably pugs up there in the daytime they're coming out of an evening uh, and it just happened that you know that they're, they're, they're coming out from the right and they come out at an angle to the boys are off there you knew they were going out that way but yeah one rod's there and one rod's there so it was just perfect perfect line so yeah I, I was pretty sure they were they were pugged up in that bay in the daytime not lots of fish you know it's probably only you might only have two or three fish in there each day like you know uh, which again was one of the reasons I never used lots of bait. You know, it's like you were really effectively, I'm in a corner of a big pit. You know, it's not the sort of place you're going to bait the fish to. Do you know what I mean? They go in there and then and, and really all I wanted was little traps, like, you know. Um, and the other thing on my mind as well, I didn't want the spots to become too blatant. Uh, to be honest with you, the right hand mark was already pretty, pretty blatant, the one in the middle of the bay, this hump. The left one rod was, was lovely, was silkweed all over it, little clearings in amongst it, and then the one bit probably only the size of this table, which, which was where I was casting my rig. Uh, so I never went too mad on the bait, and that was mainly because I didn't want the spots to become too clear too quick. So yeah, there was that evening with lots of liners, uh, two or three fish actually topped out, really close in, then went quiet through the night. Uh, even dawn was quiet as well. Uh, but probably, I don't know, two or three hours after first light, that left rod, again, that left rod, the same rod that had the common on, the 32, uh, that one melted off. Again, you know, everything was pretty much the same with these big pit fish, you know, took a load of line and then it was pretty much led it in like a dog on a lead, you know. But once it was close in, it was really rucking. And the weed was starting to become a bit of an issue now as well, you know, so it was picking up weed on the line and what have you, had a load around the rod tip, you know. It was trying to get into the snags up to the right and end up sort of walking towards it. Do you know what I mean? I'm out in the, up in the water up to chest in chest waders. Got him in, looked him in the net, another nice one, another mirror, another ni nice one of 30 pounds, six ounces.
another lovely fish, mate. And with that being on that left-hand rod again and in the morning, do you reckon that fish was on its way back into the bay for the day? That's the, definitely the impression I was getting, yeah. And it was that sort of time in the morning as well. You know, it was pretty late morning. Although saying that, in front of the next point down, the weed was now hitting the surface, you know, and there was quite a lot of it. And uh, it was probably in the days after that, just following it, I remember seeing fish there in the daytime. So there was a little period of time where I felt that it was quite possible they were there in that weed, as well as the odd one under the snags to the right, and the left rod wasn't too far from that spot, you know. Bite-wise, um, most of the takes were in the mornings, you know, so maybe that was what was going on. They were coming back in. Oh, I had two or three very early as well. The next bite, I'm not sure it was the following morning or the morning after, but again, it was the same sort of time. Another big heavy battle. Uh, this time around, I knew it was a, it was another good one. You know, it wasn't dissimilar to that 42 pounder fight-wise. A uh, lot of the fight I had to wade out again and go round the corner. And, and the fish went left. Ah, and uh, what I haven't mentioned as well is uh, when I'd brought the boat into that swim, because when I first started fishing, I didn't have the boat in the swim. The boat was on the other side of the lake. But at some point, I boated across. And as I boated in and come up, up the margin, just before I got to my swim, I noticed a bit of a, it was a snag basically on the bottom, but a bit of a branch poking up out the weed. So now reel the clock forward a bit. I'm there, I'm stood in the waders out to the left of the swim and I'm playing what's obviously a good fish. I've got it all the way in, but it's under the tip, boring away. And I can't remember where that branch was. Was it there? Was it there? Do you know what I mean? So the whole time I'm playing the fish, a bit heavier than I would have liked, you know, trying to, didn't want it to get all the way down, like, you know. Uh, again, the weed was becoming a bit of an issue by then as well, so it got a bit of weed on its head, made it a little bit easier, got him into the net, um, rolled him over a couple of times in the net, and I was pretty sure I knew what one that was. It was one that Jim had had the year before, around 40 pound. Hey, that's what it's all about, isn't it? You only want one like that every year. One like that a year, and that'll do you. When I say dark, I mean black. Like, you know, and underneath his chin, it had, it was so black that the, where it wasn't black, you know, underneath and under on his belly and that, it was like white, creamy white color. Mega, mega carp. Uh, put him on the scales, 39 and a half pound. Like, you know, I think I said to Jack, like, you know, oh, mate, you only want one like that a year, don't you? <laughs> Another two. <laughs> Different from the first fish, you know, the first fish was dark, but chestnut dark. Do you know what I mean? And this one was charcoal dark. You know, like you get a brown dark, don't you, and a black dark, you know? That's a proper one, isn't it? Mm. Well scaly, lots of scale and some nice twisted ones, you know, when they look like they've just been slapped on but round the wrong way, you know, and a real a line of them, half a dozen low down as well on the belly where you wouldn't normally see scales. Just everything you'd ever hope for in a big carp, mate. So you've got a spot established now, mate. You've got a nice swim, sort of base camp type thing. What was the weather doing and you know, what time of year was this now? We're sort of into uh, middle of May-ish and yeah, it was a nice swim and all. You know, the weather was hot by then and the swim was well shaded. But at the same time, you had a track behind you and some open ground, you know, which got the sun. So yeah, I was in my shorts and t-shirt out there in the sun most days, you know. You didn't have the rods out a lot through the daytime, you know. And, uh, and also, you know, I'd go for walks, you know, stretch my legs and that. Uh, I've got quite into my old nature photography as well the last couple of years, so I was up and down the track with my camera, photographing all the different butterflies. I think I photographed 14 different butterflies there. Like, you know, um, you know, just nice, mate. Just a just, just, just beautiful place to be, you know, and at a lovely time of the year. It was pretty hot, you know, a lot of those days through that period of time in the spring. And, um, you know, the rods would be in, and like, you know, the sun would sort of shine into the swim. You know what I'm like, like a bit, bit like what I was like when I was on the old, old boat, like, you know, I like to look after my main lines and uh, keep them wet through the day. It just makes them, if, if you let them dry out completely, then they cast out like wire, don't they? You know, all coily and what have you, you know? So yeah, I used to pour water over the, over the reels in the daytime and I'd move the rods around the swim so the sun wasn't <laughs> shining on them, you know? So you've already got a few nice fish under your belt, Tal. We haven't sort of actually mentioned whether you were after a particular target. Uh, was that the case or not? No, 
uh, which is unusual for me. You know, normally I've got a, a particular big one in mind. You know, obviously, like I said at the beginning, you know, I did have shots of half a dozen, and one of those I've just caught that 39 pounder. If I'd had any fish in mind, then that was definitely one of them. But you know, it's what it's like with these big pits, you know, and there's a lot of rumours, you know, there's uncaught mythical giants, who knows? You know, a pit of that, like I say, um, even now, you know, a couple of friends have said, well, did you see any of them bigger than that? I was like, well, no, but I didn't really, I didn't see half of what I caught either in the water. Um, it's not like I was getting around the lake lots and that, you know, there wasn't, I couldn't really get around the whole lake. And also where the boats were out in the daytime, the speed boats, you know, that's the time that you were likely to be out looking yourself and you couldn't be. You couldn't have your boat in the water at the same time as the, as the speed boats. And when the speed boats wasn't out, you had rods in the water, you know, and time went very, very quickly. You know, for all I know, there is some others in there, you know, but just with the ones that I knew were there. Being honest, mate, a, lot, a great deal of it was about the mystery. You know, and, and I don't want to, I wouldn't want it to be any other way. I'm quite happy not knowing what's, what's in there in a strange way. I did manage uh, one more take that trip, and this time around it was on the right rod, which was nice, you know, because up until then, you know, it was all good. Other than that very first fish was on a choddy, um, all the action was coming on that left mark, you know, and it, you know, I can use three rods there, and I'm only using two as it is, but only one of them is going, sort of thing, you know. So when the right rod went, it's a much more blatant area that was in the middle of the bay, a bit of an exposed hump. Uh, but yeah, that one melted off with an old 15 pound common, like, you know, uh, clearly an original. Do you know what I mean? It had a lovely ball nose dead on it, and that little bit of pink around its mouth, you know, like that, that lovely colours the old ones get. Yeah, and just the fact that it was an old one and an original, you know, I was, I was well chuffed with him. 15 pound, that's big enough for me. was still baiting uh, pretty lightly. You know, but the thing is, by now, the weed in places was starting to touch the surface, especially around the left mark. And it's hard to explain, but when you were out there and you had the spot, there was a clump of weed here, a bit of a channel there and a bit of a channel, and that weed, weed was there like a solid bank. It, everything just that was coming into the area was directed straight across that first little mark. It was just bang on. Um, and the last thing I wanted to do was be baiting it heavy and ruining it, you know, I didn't want it to open out any more than it was. In fact, when the boats used to come out in the daytime, you know, and they'd go for that bit of weed, I was like, no, leave my bit of weed alone. That was the other thing as well to, you had to take into account. Um, although you had good clarity, you know, it was generally in the mornings, you know, after it had a night to settle, because when then boats were out all day, if you'd gone to try to go out in the evening, then you'd probably have a bit too much colour in the water. You know, it's like the weed itself just has sediment and that hanging on it, and then the, the boats go through it and they just kick it up and just put a little bit of colour in the water. So. I was getting into a bit of a routine by then, like, you know, um, I used to keep my eye on the sailing club, I could see the sailing club in the distance, so you wanted to leave the rods out as long as you could into the mornings, you know, um, but there was, uh, once that weather was really hot, you know, we had proper summer conditions, then quite often eight o'clock in the morning the first people would turn up for the boats, and you couldn't see the sailing club lawn, you could see the slipway and the jetties, so the first I'd see would be a boat reversing down onto the slipway, and at that point I'd really quickly get my boat out, and because they used to take half hour or so, they'd get the boat ready, like, you know. Once the boat was out on the water, but the, you couldn't go out, that's against the rules. But yeah, as soon as I see them turn up with the boat, I'd be like, rod straight in, straight out there in the boat, check me marks, put out a little bit of bait, and then straight back in again. And, and the marker's out as well. And then the boats had come out and then I'd be sat there for the day waiting, like, you know, but at least I knew my spots were already baited. So, so more often than not, my spots were baited in the mornings, ready for the night ahead. I've seen some of the footage, the underwater footage of the spot tell, and I, th you know, you say you're fishing, you're fishing bottom baits over it. I think a lot of anglers, due to the silkweed and so on, would prefer to fish a pop-up or, because you could use a boat, drop the rig onto the spot. Why, why were you casting? Again, because of the boats, you know, um, the boats would be out in the daytime, sometimes they'd be out until right into the light is going, you know, especially when it was hot and sunny, they were out there up until gone eight o'clock in the evening. Um, not only that, even if they had gone in at seven or eight o'clock in the evening, after being out all day, they put that colour in the water and then there was every chance they wouldn't even be able to see the spot, like, you know. So, uh, yeah, I really wanted to be casting, but I know exactly what you mean. There was times when I thought to myself, especially after looking at it in the mornings from the boat, you know, maybe I should have a pop-up on this, maybe a soft boat. You know, I didn't want to have a choddy, you know, maybe a bit too blatant over it, especially if it landed on a clean bit, you know. But, uh, yeah, it was going through me, maybe I should have like a soft boom and a pop-up. But, um, no, I had it clipped up perfectly, mate, like, you know, and although the spot was only small, you knew when you did it, you know, like, I had it, I had it all lined up perfectly. I knew the clip mark was dead right. Uh, I used to wait to exactly, I always used to cast out in my waders. 
Uh, and I earlier mentioned that little corral branch that poked out, you know, so as to wade and, and stand dead level to that. I ended up with a, a little depression in the bottom. It was about a foot deeper there than everywhere else around me, where I used to stand on the same spot. But yeah, you knew when you hit the mark, you know, and it'd only have to go like a foot, six inches even, left or right of where I wanted it, and I'd reel in. Wouldn't let the lid at, lead at the bottom. And yeah, I mean, fortunately, you know, more often than not, you know, it's not like I've done lows, but more often than not, they there was one on the end in the morning, you know, so it's not lows that I reeled in to see what it was like. Uh, but when I did, you know, if nothing happened, I'd tighten all the way up to the ledge, you know, and then lift it quick. And it was genuinely pretty clean. You know, you might pick up a little bit on the retrieve, on the retrieve, because there was weed between me and the spot. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it was hit and miss, but um, I think I got more hits than misses like on it. So you've got two spots going now, Tell, and they're both producing fish. Yeah, but, the left rod's clearly the better of the two spots. You know, I'd picked up one on that right-hand rod, but I'll be honest with you, it all seemed a little bit blatant there. Um, really, I was, when I did go out in the boats in the mornings, I was trying to find something else for that right rod. Uh, but really, it was at that point, I would, and the way the weeds was growing and everything, you know, that left rod was definitely the better of the two spots. It, in fact, it seemed to produce the better fish as well as time went on. Um, my very next fish off of that was a 31 and a half pound common. Uh, again, left rod. Well, I was hoping to have a good tail for you this morning, but unfortunately I lost one, uh, first thing. And there was a bit of a build up to it as well. Um, in the evening, yesterday evening, um, well, I'll go back earlier than that. In the late afternoon at range, there's a lot of weed out here, surface weed, which is handy because the boats don't seem to come all the way into it. But um, late afternoon at range, over 100 yards away, but I was watching through the binoculars, I could see one on the surface sunning itself long fish as well even at that range you know you can see its hump was here and its tail was over here you know oh the old boats are out good job actually because I, I got my bait in only about 10 minutes ago they're like the harley davidsons of the boat world these lot i tell you monster engines on them but so anyway i've seen seen a big fish yesterday afternoon um just up in the water. In hindsight, it's probably one that uh, me and Jack see a couple of days earlier up to the left. Uh, just had the same sort of character to it, you know, watching it through the binos. But a long fish, clearly a big one. Uh, so I was hopeful, like, you know. And then in the, after, in the evening, uh, once the boat traffic slowed down, the lake went calm and things started to happen. Like, you know, one came chugging through short. Uh, the tench were frolicking about, you know, just lazy rolls, little subtle rolls. It was all going on. I was getting the odd little liner. And then just into dark, it all went quiet. Um, nice night's sleep. Uh, but I woke up at half past four to a little liner on my banker rod, the one I've had most of my action on. Um, two or three minutes later, another liner, but a bit more substantial, like, you know, a real slow one. Du, 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 all the way to the top and then down again. So I thought I'd better get up, like, you know, there's something going on out there. And uh, I was only out of bed, sort of two or three minutes, and, and the indicator smacked to the, to the butt, like, you know, I had quite a tight clutch. The indicator smacked to the butt, tips bent round. I picked up the rod, um, flat calm out there, like you know, you can see the weed up the surface, you can see my hole. Like, but the fish has hit the surface, big tail slap, it was a big black tail as well. Uh, big push of water, it tore off about 10 yards of line off of me through the weed. Uh, ground to a halt, fine, you know, not much different to a lot of the other fish have done, like you know. Um, slipped my waders on and that's so how I was ready, and then just started to tease it out of the weed first. And it, eh, and it just started to come out and the up pulled, just fell off. Um, I'm a bit gutted, I've got to be honest with you, do you know what I mean? I don't like losing any of them, like, you know, but it's always, the, I'm always wary when things are going so well, like, you know, like, it can't go perfectly forever, something's going to happen, and, uh, and unfortunately it has, I've lost one. But um, fingers crossed, you never know, it might well have been one of the two big mirrors that I've already caught. Uh, it was that sort of size fish to me, it was a big fish, but anyway, uh, I've been back out, uh, spots look good, all the bait was gone, uh, put out a bit more bait out there and it was lucky I did because uh, we've got a hot day and it looks like those boats are going to be out all day now. I won't be getting the rods out until 8, 9 o'clock tonight by the look of it. Yeah, at the time I was a little bit concerned that it might have been one that I'd been watching. Um, I'd been seeing it, watching it through the binoculars and through my old long lens on the, on the camera light, you know. 
um, but it was always on the surface a lot, this fish. And I can think of two or three pickings that I've fished for in the past that had that sort of character, like the Richmond Park, the Royal 40. That used to sit on the surface an awful lot with a bit of its tail exposed, like, you know? And that's what it reminded me of. And when I lost that fish, it, that fish had been around the area a lot. One day you'd see it stuck in that weed bed, then another day it'd be over in that weed bed, but it was always around that corner, that, that part of the lake. Uh, and when I dropped that fish, and then I never saw that, the old basking shark, I never saw it that day, I never saw it the next day. You know, I was fearing the worst. I thought, oh, I bet that's the one I've lost. I did, though, go on to see it about a week later, uh, and it was up to me left. Uh, and I remember seeing it in the evening and looking through it through, through the binoculars. Um, and then when I got up at four o'clock in the morning, it was still there in exactly the same place, which made me suspect that maybe there was something not quite right. Maybe it was one that had been hit by a speedboat. Who knows? You know, I was talking to one of the tench anglers and he reckons most years one, one ends up getting hit by the speedboats. Uh, that's the thing with them old speedboats. They take the same course for most of the day. And, the, and then you've got all rafts of weed elsewhere where the boats aren't going, so the fish go to those as sanctuaries, like, you know, and they'll be sat up in the weed, you know, the boats are doing their things. And then all of a sudden, one of the boats will just take a diversion and go straight through the middle of a weed bed, you know, and you cringe, you go, oh my God, oh my God, like, you know, what's just happened, you know? So who knows, you know, and a big old carp, you know, they're a little bit slower to get out of the way. Um, if any are ever going to get hit by a boat, I would imagine it to be the bigger ones. And if you look at uh, that 42 pounder, you know, obviously happened many years ago, but if you look along its dorsal line, there's a little bit of a dip and a little bit, and it looks to me like it was probably hit many years ago and then it's healed up. As I say, like those boats would be out most days and, um, and so my rods would be in most days, like, you know. Uh, but there was one afternoon I remember, the thing with the boats, they'd go out for a couple of hours and then they'd go in on the lawn and have a barbecue and a bit of a social, you know, you could always watch, see what was going on over there. Uh, but yeah, they'd been in for about 10 minutes or so, so the lake had gone calm. And there was a lot of lovely, lovely foliage at the front of the swim, I never damaged anything, only just a little gap for each rod, like, you know. And I just saw rings, just ripples come out from the bank, just like a mooring or something was down there, you know, but I knew it wasn't no bird. And I, I got up and crept closer and looked over the top and there was two carp there, which on a pit of that size, you know, and I've got two four foot from the bank right in front of me swim, was pretty mad. Uh, one of them was a lovely scaly, scaly one, clearly a 20 pounder. And the other one at first I thought was a little common, single figured fish like, you know. Yeah, they, they sort of ambled about, they actually fed. It's very, very, they fed where I'd been wading. You know, that's how close in they was on the, on the, the cleaned off gravel where I'd been wading back and forth. So as soon as they just, well, they, the, all the snags were up to the right and they just sort of ambled about for a little bit, disappeared back off to the right and I crumbled up two or three boilies, put them where they was. It was only five or 10 minutes later. Next time they come in and they just went straight on them, tails up in the air and that. I think I've even got a little bit of footage because I, like you do, my rods were in, ready to go for the night ahead. So I even had baited rigs ready, sat, on, sat in the bucket. So I, I got one of those rods, put on one of my rigs, and then when I had a chance, lowered it in right on the edge, just laid the rod on the clutch. Uh, and you might even have a little bit of footage where they came back and that far from the bank, you know, the bigger one of the two, the 20 pounder, its tail actually lops out, go, goes like that, and then disappears again, like, you know. I did have a little flicker as well. I remember seeing the smaller of the two. I'm sat well back, you know, I don't even want to stand up to get a better look, but I see the smaller of the one of the two come in and just go down right where my rig was. And now I'm looking at the line and I see the line go like that, just an inch, you know, that little flicker, like, you know, but he wasn't on the ends, like, you know, and then it all went quiet after that. Um, anyway, got the rods out that evening, both marks, like I said, I'm only sort of 15 yards out on each spot. And uh, you wouldn't believe it, but like the following morning, the left rod's gone first, the banker rod that was normally for the better fish, but I've caught the little one. It was actually one of the newer stockies, uh, the, the, the syndicate, leader had put in another little batch of fish probably two or three years earlier you know so it was one of those um it's actually one that one of the other carp anglers had got had already caught and one of the tench anglers caught it as well so it's quite a friendly one so yeah that first fish that morning that little and that was on the left rod um so i've still got one rod fishing and whereas normally i'd have to reel in as soon as the boats came out because they were out pretty early that morning eight o'clock in the morning but uh Normally I've got a rod halfway across that bay, that right rod, you know, on that blatant here I've mentioned. But this time round I had it a little bit closer in, I'd had a good boat around, I'd found something, only a couple of rods out from the bank up to me right. Um, close enough in to sort of risk leaving the rod out for a bit. You know, if the boats came too close then I'd have to reel it in. But um, it's probably about 10 o'clock in the morning, the boats are doing their thing, really churning it up. I mean these boats are, you know, they've got big engines, they're V8s, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, powerful old boats, like, you know. Um, yeah, and that right rod, about 10 o'clock in the morning, well late for there, you know, it's, it's, the old tip's gone round, I've got one on. 
bit of a, t all of the fights were, you know, they weed up for a little bit, but the weed was never too much of an issue. Like, you know, waded out, got him in the old net. And as soon as I looked in the net, I thought that's definitely the one I was looking at yesterday. And as was that fully scaled. So basically both of those two fish that I'd seen in the margin the day before, I caught one on each rod the following morning, which sort of was a bit of a confidence boost, you know. But uh, yeah, put him on the scales, 26 pound and ounces, and it was the most beautiful looking carp you could imagine, like, you know, black as you're at and like covered in scales. Um, when I talked to the syndicate leader, he said he, he knew the fish, but it hadn't been out for several years, you know, which, um, you know, is quite typical for there. There are two or three fish came out this year that hadn't been out in years and years and years. So yeah, mate, another good trip. Um, finished with four takes that, that session. Uh, unfortunately dropped one, like, you know, but landed three. July time on those big pits, they often get bad algal blooms, you know, and this lake's famous for it, as are a lot of big pits, you know. Um, so that was on my mind, you know, the water still had plenty of clarity, you know, and I needed clarity to be able to see my marks. But yeah, it, it, you, you, you could see the water was starting to get that little bit of algae, you know, you could see it in the, in just hanging in the water, you know, the little strands. Um, so it was a case of sort of getting in as much as I possibly could and making the most of it. Uh, I remember, I can't remember, was I was at a dentist appointment or something like the front, but, but I remember I had one night in between, you know, I was doing something or other, but I had one night and I still went and still managed to winkle a couple out, not, not big ones. Uh, again, it was one on that left rod, the, the banker mark, but I caught another one on the right margin, uh, two small ones. One of them was another one of the younger fish, sort of 14 pound, uh, and another one was definitely another old original, but not a big one, 17 pound, 12 ounces, both commons. I think after that, um, even, even in the space of just three or four days, when I got back the next trip, the water looked green. You know, it was going that quick. We'd had a lot of sunny weather uh, and I fished a four night blank. That was the first time that the swim looked completely devoid of fish. Everything had changed, you know. Up until then, we'd had regular winds with easterly in it, whether it was a southeast or a northeast, always had a touch of east, but then it went round to what it would normally be at this time, of the, at that time of the year. It was a southwest, you know, the predominant wind, completely away from the area. Um, and the spot had died a death completely, you know. Really, I knew two nights in that I should probably call it a day, but you know, it's like, you know, you keep looking at the weather and oh, and there's a slight lick of southerly coming in at the end of the, so you think, just one more night, and that was what it was like, you know. But uh, no, four night blank that trip. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, the water had gone pretty green. I did have a couple of nights elsewhere around the lake uh, on the end of the southwest Liz, but I felt like it was a little bit too late to get anything going in a different part of the lake. I had other places on mind as well. I had a little pool in Oxfordshire that I was looking forward to getting over to. Um, so I called it a day for a bit. But uh, I did go back at the start of August, you know, and it was a bit of a one-off trip. I'd been fishing in Oxfordshire, uh, seen the weather just before I left to, to drive home. I'd seen the weather and thought, oh, there's a little bit of southeasterly coming in there and it was warm. And just on the chart, just on the off chance, I, I, I was expecting the water to still be green, like, you know. But I stopped in on my way home, pulled up behind the swim, walked down and the water had gone clear. But you know when you can see um, bits of like dead algae and what have you, you know, like on the surface and an old weed, you could see it had suffered a bad algal bloom for a while, but it had just cleared. It had only been cleared days. Uh, and I got the up, my boat was all still there, exactly, I'd left my boat there. Uh, went out in the boat, went out to that left mark and it was choddier than it had been all through the spring when I was fishing it in the early summer. But there was still the odd bit that looked fed on, you know, and I just thought, oh, it's worth a night, like, you know, I'll just put the rods out. In fact, the right rod was so, where I'd normally fish the right rod, there was no spot at all. It was completely covered in silkweed. So as mad as it sounds, you know, 70 acre pit and all that, I sat there that night with one rod out and off it went, like, you know, early hours of the morning, uh, 31 pounder. Um, unusual, I didn't, didn't even know there was a ghost in there, but yeah, ghost carp, ghost common, like you do, like you know, for, oh, maybe I could just squeeze in another night then, like you know, and I stayed on another night and had a 25 pounder. So you've got to think, you know, I've been away for five weeks and I've just dropped back for two nights and had one each night, you know, and the following week I had three as well. And I'm looking at the weather forecast and we've got south easterlies, mega hot weather and everything. I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm having it off next week, like you know, went back the next week dead as a door now, four nights. In fact, my bait was still there, and it wasn't a great deal of bait either, but my bait was still there from the end of the previous trip. So uh, that was pretty much it, like, you know, or at least it was for this year anyway. So sitting here now, Tel, we're sort of just on the cusp of autumn, but looking back, you've got to be chuffed with that spring, summer, or early summer campaign. Mate, honestly, uh, you know, it just goes to show, you know, there's nothing certain in carp fishing, you know, like, I couldn't have dreamt in my wildest dreams that, that it turned out like that, you know, how things went. Um, you know, I felt that like I'd, I'd got a bit of a 
bum deal being honest, you know what I mean? One part of the lake, like, you know, not a lot, great deal to go at. Um, but you know, you can never predict what the winds are going to do and how, how conditions are going to pan out. And uh, it just, everything seemed to work in my favour, like, you know. And, and the other good thing was, you know, although the spring was definitely, you know, it was the right part of the lake for the spring, um, as the year went on, you know, all, all of the other members done well as well. You know, everyone caught, everyone ended up happy. You know, and that's what you need on a, on a syndicate, you know, with everyone being happy, you know. So, yeah, right now I'm, uh, I'm just hoping to be able to sort of follow, carry on where I left off. You know, I'm looking forward to next spring, um, hopefully get back in the same plot. Um, highly unlikely to get the same sort of wind conditions like we did for so many weeks, you know, with all those easterlies. Um, but who knows, I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed and uh, yeah, I just can't wait to get back, mate.